young couple purchases a neighborhood haunt. They get much more than they bargained for. There was so much activity, and there seemed to be so many entities in one location. Ghostly pranks quickly turn aggressive, threatening the safety and sanity of everyone who comes in the front door. We were dealing with something much bigger than ourselves. It was getting more personal, it was getting more dangerous. I was truly scared at that point. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. In 2007, Jason Ryder surprises his wife, Lynn, with an unexpected gift. Okay, open them. What? It's Maury's. We are the new owners of Maury's. Maury's is a popular Meriden, Connecticut restaurant. Oh my God. So Maury's was basically the place that everyone has a story about in Meriden, because that is the place we all grew up. A lot of people uh, from the town, they would go there. So it was almost like a cheers. What are you doing? <laughs> Jason and Lynn frequented Maury's on dates and dreamed they would one day own the place. I kind of got blindsided by the purchase of Maury's. I didn't know. Jason's pretty good about that kind of stuff. After three months of renovations, Lynn and Jason renamed the bar Riders. Lynn's father, Barry, is recruited to help. Lynn is a people person. If she has people around her, she's totally happy. Both Lynn and Jason quickly discover that running a restaurant and a bar is more challenging than they ever imagined. Lynn, we are on our last bottle of tequila, and the ice machine is on the fritz again. We were up there seven days a week. Some days it was 15, 16 hours a day. We were still trying to learn the business. Also, we need to order more shot glasses. I just ordered new ones last week. Where'd they go? I don't know. I usually had about 48 shot glasses. As the weeks went on, I was down to like two shot glasses. And then I would buy 24 more. And a couple days later, I'd be down to five shot glasses. This is getting expensive. So I questioned my staff as to, are you breaking them? Are you throwing them out? Are people stealing them? <laughs> The shot glasses are not the only items disappearing in the bar. Lynn's keys frequently go missing. We would spend sometimes almost up to an hour looking for keys. They would go missing pretty much every day for a while. In the beginning, I thought I was losing my mind. And then it started to happen more frequently. So I started questioning who's doing it. Lynn often comes in early in the morning to catch up on paperwork. It's the only quiet time she has before opening the restaurant for the day. Up until now, she's never been disturbed. I heard my name, and not just my name, I heard Lynn Murray, which is my full name. What? Dad, Jason, what? What do you guys want? I'm swamped here. It sounded like it was coming from out in the restaurant, like my husband or my dad was yelling for me. I wasn't really pleased that I had to get up because I was extremely busy. Dad? 
Jason? I looked around, and the building was empty. And the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I told Jason that I felt like I was being watched. He basically just said, listen, you're tired. You work a lot of hours. Jason's assurance that nothing strange is going on does not make Lynn feel better. When something inside me tells me that I need to kind of be on alert, there's usually a reason. Several days later, it's Super Bowl Sunday, and Lynn prepares for a party at the restaurant. Suddenly, Lynn feels a tap on her shoulder. And then another. The second tap was harder. It was hard enough that my attention needed to be caught. Marcy? Marcy, you there? Lynn, do you need help? You got it? Were you just in the basement? No, Lynn, I just got here. I need to get back upstairs. Things moving or, or disappearing, that's one thing. For something to be able to come up and touch you, I mean, it's scary. Over the next few weeks, Lynn continues to have strange experiences in the restaurant. But each time she tries to talk about it with her family, they laugh it off. Everybody was teasing me at that point. Like, oh, what's the matter, Lynn? Did your ghost do it? So it was a big joke. I mean, it was a constant joke. Well, we joked around a lot because we just thought this was just, you know, it was a way to ease the tension. You leaving? Mm-hmm. I need to go to the post office. I'll lock up. OK. I had beer bottles all over the place. They were on the floor, they were moved around. I'm the only one in the bar. The bar is locked. I cannot fathom how this could have happened. There's no logical explanation. I get very, very uneasy because I can't figure this out. The next day, Barry stocks the beer cooler before opening. He thinks he's alone. Not funny! Hey, come on! Open the door! Jason! Open the door! I was afraid. If you've ever been in combat, if you've ever had somebody literally trying to kill you, that's the feeling you get. And that's the exact feeling I had. Open the door! Come on, open the door! Seriously, come on! Hey, come on! Open the door! Barry Eichenauer is working alone in his daughter's bar when someone or something locks him in the beer cooler. Come on, open the door! I caught my breath, and now I had to get my wits about me. I had to figure out what was going on. Dad! Yeah? Are you okay? I heard someone yelling. I'm okay now. The look on his face, alone, told me that he was a little scared. He was never going to admit it to me. I've been in that cooler a million times. It's never locked on me. 
The, the door can't even close by itself. This was what really started me to get into her corner and say, look, you've got to figure out what's going on. Lynn fears there is something supernatural lurking in the shadows of her restaurant. Her mother convinces her that a psychic may see what Lynn cannot. Do you own a bar? Yes. I sense two mischievous entities at your restaurant. She said to me, you have two spirits. And they weren't really happy with some of the things I was doing. She told me that they had been there for many, many years. And instead of going into a power struggle with them, I needed to go back to the restaurant and kind of just make peace with the fact that they were there. They've taken several items and hidden them in the basement. And she described it with the dirt cellar. She told me exactly what corner and what box to look behind. She says, you'll find them. My parents had to drop me off at the restaurant. I immediately ran downstairs and started digging through exactly where she told me to go. The very moment that I pulled back the last box and found shot glasses, I kind of froze. I did freeze and was like, whoa, okay. What are you doing back here? Jason. I found the shot glasses exactly where the psychic said they would be. Anyone could have brought those glasses down here. It proves nothing. <sighs> don't say anything to the employees. I don't want them thinking they work for a crazy person. I didn't want my wife to pretty much be telling people about this, because I don't want them to think that she was a nutcase, you know, seeing this or seeing that. I knew I wasn't crazy at that point, but that's when you really got to start going, OK, wait, we're dealing with something, you know? And you don't know what's going to happen. A week later, Lynn hires Tito Corciato to be a bouncer and help out around the bar. She doesn't tell him about the strange occurrences. When I first started working at Riders, I didn't have any weird feelings towards the bar. I've never heard any stories about anything. Dad, would you run down to the basement, pick up a couple of more boxes of martini glasses for me? Oh, I'll get them. Thanks, Tito. You could feel the change of temperature. It was very cold down there. Who's there? Jason? Is that you? What the? Register tape was thrown at me. <laughs> Good try, Jason. I thought it was Jay playing around with me, because Jay loves to play jokes. So I thought it was Jay. That same evening, Tito helps with cleanup after closing. To actually see pots flying off on their own and there's no one back there, that was the scariest moment. That made me believe that there were actually some supernatural activities going on at Riders. Later that night. Yeah, what is it? OK, uh, I'll meet the police there in a few minutes. The alarm company again? Third time this week. Damn, I swear.
This particular time, the police didn't show up, so I figured somebody's breaking into the building. I see like three black shadows. I'm like, oh, here we go. Jason has no idea what danger is just behind the door. After the alarm goes off in the restaurant, Jason Ryder believes intruders have broken in. I figure I had to get into a fight, and so I'm getting myself all pumped up, you know, all juiced up and everything else. I kick open the door, nobody's there. I go home. Hour later, the alarm goes off again. Alarm went off like five times that night. As the nightly bar scene at Ryder's picks up, Lynn and Jason's secret grows even more difficult to keep. Come <laughs> What the? The cue ball came up in the air and jumped over all the other balls and just hit the table. Listen, I didn't touch it. That is not OK. Guys, guys, I am so sorry. We are going to have to have this table checked to make sure that it's level. We chalked it up to the floors being on level that night or something. I didn't want to scare people. OK, let's get a beer. But the customers know what they saw. Later that same evening, a woman is in the ladies' restroom alone. if she was okay and she couldn't talk to me at that point she specifically said to me i do not believe in heaven and i do not believe in hell but i do not even know how to tell you what i just saw you need to see something she then asked me to please go into my bathroom and look at the wall i'm sorry i, I don't know what to say I was starting to feel hopeless. There were more and more people coming forward to me. And the more that people came forward to me, the more standoffish I was. Because not only could I not explain it to them, but I couldn't do anything to fix it. The paranormal pranks at Riders are no longer harmless. People are scared. Lynn and Jason are not sure how to solve the problem. They continue to run the restaurant as if nothing happened. I think my husband was frustrated because Jay is a fixer, and that's what he does. And he couldn't fix this. And I think that he didn't want to admit to me that he couldn't protect us. And I think that bothered him. 
Jason continues to do what he does best, fix whatever is broken. On a 90 degree summer day, Jason is in the basement repairing a leaky pipe. As soon as I went in there, it was like just cold, dry air, like death. I could see the smoke coming from my breath, and it was definitely not a, a cold day. see it will say shadows or I think I see somebody right there next to me or like 10 feet away and I would look they wouldn't be there I knew I really saw something despite the tension Lynn continues to go through the motions of her routine but this morning will be unlike any other Lynn Marie DestinationAmerica.com Lynn Ryder is trapped in the back of her restaurant. And the energy was tight. It was almost as if you couldn't breathe. There was really nowhere for me to go at that point because I was in the back corner of the building and I was alone. It scared me. It's one thing to know that there's a presence. It's another thing to know that they know you're there. <laughs> the fact that it knew my name, and not just my first name, it, it bothered me. That was something personal. Lynn reaches out to a friend for help, clairvoyant and medium Karen Hollis. Lynn had a real sense that I wouldn't lead her astray. If she needed some type of therapy, I was going to send her to the right person. And if she needed the right paranormal investigative group, I would also be able to point her in the right direction. Karen arrives and takes a look around the entire restaurant, including the basement. My first feeling about it was, it just felt heavy. The air felt heavy. When we had walked in, the, the room was ice cold. I got a sense of, why are you here? The minute I walked into the bar. Yep, this place is haunted. We've got something here. It's been my experience that mirrors specifically antique mirrors, because they reflect back to us our own perceptions on reality, create doorways to other dimensions. And I thought to myself, oh yeah, that's the portal. That's where they're coming through. A portal is a doorway that can allow something from a different dimension to come into our particular plane of existence. Lynn. Karen recommends Lynn get rid of the mirror and that she contact a paranormal investigation team Karen works with. A week later, Karen and the ghosts of New England Research Society arrive after closing to investigate. Kurt Knapp runs the team. I was very excited to get an investigation underway there. At the same time, I was a little bit skeptical because it just seemed to be too much going on there for any one place. 
Before arriving, Kurt Knapp researches Ryder's history. We always try to look at the place from a historic perspective to see what happened there. Because in New England, there are so many layers of history. He learns Ryder's was originally two residences built in the 1800s, later joined together to become a feed store, paint store, and finally Maury's before Lynn and Jason took over. Town lore claims two deaths resulted from a fire in 1976. Could these be the ghosts haunting the bar? Kurt approaches his investigations with an open mind. We try to approach each investigation with a scientific method and also a psychic method. We don't discount the client's claims, but we take them with a grain of salt, realizing that most clients are not trained observers. You got everything under control. Okay. I'll lock up. Okay, thank you. Joe and Karen, I want you to go into the basement. Mike, you and I are gonna go to the kitchen. There was a heaviness in the air. And the minute I turned the corner, I got a sense of an entity that was over my left shoulder. I know you're here. I can feel it. Please, come forward. heard in real time, I'm so weak. When I asked telepathically, in what way are you weak? Are, is it emotionally or physically? It answered both. And it was shocking. I heard it, we marked it, disembodied voice. I knew at that point we had a very haunted bar. Karen senses several more spirits, but they will not communicate with her. I felt the presence of at least two separate entities. But many times when you're investigating a haunting, it feels like a game of hide and go seek. The energy moves, moves away from you. So it doesn't want to let you know that it's actually there. Investigators set up a laser grid in the basement to detect motion. We thought we'd do an impromptu EVP session in the dirt floor part of the cellar. I felt something tap me on the back of the head. I have movement in the grid. the ghosts of New England Research Society are looking for verifiable proof that Riders is haunted. I have movement in the grid. Ah! Suddenly, an investigator is in distress. What's wrong? What happened? I don't know what it was. He said it was like something just rushed right through me. He used the comparison of like throwing a handful of sand through a screen door. I think that it was trying to show us its power, that it could do things like this and we couldn't do anything about it. We were seeing and hearing these things for ourselves and there was absolutely no doubt in our mind that there was some serious paranormal activity happening in Riders. That night, Karen decides to do a clearing to communicate with spirits in the building and attempt to cross them over. We're gonna use the tarot cards. The tarot cards provide Karen with an opportunity to communicate with the spirit through symbolism, rather than trying to capture its voice again on a digital recorder. Can you tell us who you are? Why you're here? I immediately got the Emperor card, which would indicate a male energy. When I asked, how did you die? It gave me the hanged man, that he had hanged himself. 
Lynn is astonished. There was one patron who talked to my husband and us about when he was a little boy, they used to work there. And he had told us that there was um, someone who had died by hanging. Uh, when I asked, why do I feel that you are sad in some way, he gave me the three of swords, that he was divorced, separated, heartbroken, that there had been an issue. Do you want to leave? And when I asked him, do you want to leave, he gave me the sun card, yes. OK, thank you. Now, with your permission, I'm going to create a light. And I want you to walk into it. Do you understand? He says he wants to rest. He indicated to me that, yes, he would be willing to take the chance to walk into it. I created the beam of light, and then he just disappeared. He's gone. We had released one of the more frustrating entities. But given that the building has so much history, it certainly has more work. Karen believes at least one more entity remains in the building, but does not sense anything sinister. I can't say for sure that there aren't entities or an entity at Riders that wishes no one harm. I can say that we didn't receive any indication that Lynn would be in any danger. She did explain to me that there still could be other spirits that have not come forward yet. We're just gonna have to wait and see. For the next three days, Riders feels like a normal place of business again. There are no paranormal incidents, but are the entities really gone? Late one night, Lynn and a bartender are closing the restaurant. Marcy, I think we had a really good night tonight. We did. We had a great night. that had happened, the feeling just came back. Jason? I just saw Jason in the mirror. Marcy, Jason's at home. He hasn't been here all evening. No, I just saw him. I swear I did. The feeling just came back. You don't really say anything to each other at that point, but we knew. We knew. <laughs> Despite the indication there are active spirits in her restaurant again, Lynn is determined to go on with life as normal. I had invited a couple of my girlfriends over. And because I worked so many hours, we were in the back. Let's talk about her new job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm starting next week. Yeah. We'll see. And we're going to quit before I start. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can do it. You, I know you. I you know, can do anything. You can do it. It's so nerve-wracking. But it's exciting, it's exciting right? right? No, it's good. really exciting. It's really exciting. New opportunities and everything. Yeah. We'll see. Good, good, good. <laughs> Lynn, what are you doing? Lynn, what's Lynn, talk to us. Lynn, Lynn, what are you? Okay, stop. Lynn, should we call an ambulance? I don't what's know. going on? I don't know. Oh my god, oh my god, Lynn. It was not okay. That was like the last piece of protection I had, or felt I had was to know that I had St. Michael watching over me. Lynn believes whatever is now haunting riders is more aggressive than the spirits that plagued her restaurant before the clearing. At that point, I knew that the spirit that was crossed had nothing to do with what was really going on at Riders. We were dealing with something much bigger than ourselves. Over the next few days, Lynn notices another disturbing change at her restaurant. The building changed. It changed to oppressive and negative and a feeling of danger. Hey, can I get my beer? Lynn often bartends in the afternoon until the evening shift arrives. Hey, can I get a couple more beers over here? We need two over here. I've been waiting for my drink forever. This afternoon is unusually busy. The service is horrible here. She doesn't know what she's doing. The mortgage is so far behind. I hope we don't lose the house. I don't like this drink. I hate my hair. 
A drink tastes terrible. My kids are getting bullied constantly. She's so slow. I don't even know why they keep her around. Lynn believes she's hearing everyone's thoughts. I started hearing people talking. They truly weren't speaking. In my mind, they were speaking. She's so slow. I don't even know why they keep her around. The service is horrible here. You can't protect your children. I don't like this drink. Your drink tastes terrible. She doesn't know what she's doing. My kids are getting bullied constantly. She's so slow. I don't even know why they keep her around. For Lynn Ryder, an afternoon at work suddenly takes a dark turn. I was hearing people's thoughts directed at me. It was as if I was being attacked by 57 people. I was just hearing nasty, negative things about me. You can't protect your children. I don't like this drink. The drink tastes terrible. Your business is going under. At that point, I knew I had had it. I had to call my, my family to come in. Lynn? Lenny? What's wrong? What's going on? Nobody can see you like this. This is crazy. It would be embarrassing and bad for the company. Nobody is going to the hospital. Nobody's going to the hospital. Lynn, I, I didn't say anything. You don't have to say anything. I can hear you. I can hear your thoughts. I was in a full out breakdown in my office that night. My mind shut down and my body shut down, and I, I truly lost it all in one night. Jason convinces Lynn to take a break and stay away from the restaurant for a few days. I was worried about her. She's like my partner. She's partner in business. She's my partner in life. She's the mother of my children. Lynn, it's not worth it. Jason also tells Lynn it's time to give up their dream. This is not worth it. I'd rather see her uh, just let it all go. We've worked so hard. Something had to be done to relieve the pressure. A little bit of hope and prayer. And I don't think she was going to be able to come back out of it. Just think about it. Lynn knows she has to do something to help herself. A friend recommends Lynn contact a local psychic and spiritual healer, Pam Faith. I went to Pam to strengthen my energy again so that I could protect myself. It had nothing to do with the restaurant. It was me. I needed some clarity. But Pam immediately zeroes in on the problems at Ryder's and asks Lynn to see the restaurant. She said that we needed to deal with the building before I could deal with me personally. Pam asks that her identity remains hidden. I wanted to go to her business to remove and release the bad spirits, the bad demons, so she can get her life back. Pam believes something dangerous is now haunting riders. I'm sensing several spirits and a demonic presence. I believe it's in the basement, and it's extremely dangerous. The dark ones, the uh, negative ones, whatever terminology you want to use, their intention is to harm, either physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. The bad ones want to break you down. I believe we were dealing with demons. We weren't dealing with human spirits. I need you to stay here in constant prayer. Pam will attempt to clear each room in the restaurant with prayer and by encouraging the entities present to move on. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. God the Father. When you're dealing with regular spirits, they need help, healing, in other words. So I, I will help them to heal and go to where they're supposed to go on the other side. Pam Faith does the clearing ritual in each of the rooms on the main floor of the restaurant. She will confront the demon in the basement alone. 
when you're dealing with demons that always put you at a risk for being harmed or being attacked. Just because I have gifts doesn't mean I can't get hurt. She plans to find the demon and attempt to remove it from the building with prayer. I could feel the demon in the basement. I asked God to get rid of it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For her own protection, Lynn stays upstairs praying. senses the demon. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father, rid this place of its evil, allow it to go. And give us this day our daily bread. Our Father, rid this place of its evil, allow it to go. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Our Father, rid this place of its evil. And lead us not into temptation. Allow it to go. But deliver us from evil. I felt the major shift of energy in the basement once it was gone. What a difference in the room. You could breathe. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Lynn? It's gone. Yes, it is. It's gone. It's hopefully for good, but there's no way to know for sure. When she was done with the entire building, immediately, oh, I felt like I could breathe. It looked brighter. It was as if I was walking into the building for the first time. It was nothing that I had ever felt. I was almost instantaneously at ease. Kurt Knapp and his team hope Lynn's paranormal troubles are over, but they fear the lack of activity in the restaurant is only temporary. I don't think the haunting is over at Ryder's at all. I think that there probably will always be some type of paranormal activity there. For Lynn, the experience has brought her closer to her family and made her a stronger person. I do feel that I'm stronger. It strengthened my belief in God uh, and my religion and my faith. After going through what I've been through, you know, um, I can deal with it. It's only life. I think she's a better and stronger person now than she was when this all started. Once you deal with that type of entity, and especially a demonic force, there's always a way for them to get back in. I know that I will have to protect myself and my family the rest of my life. They don't forget your names. They don't forget who you are. After a mother's visit to a distant land, this is so beautiful. Turns violent. No begging. He just pushed him down and started kicking. Get off! Her daughter begins feeling watched at home. It was like that feeling when you know someone's there. It was a ghost, a spirit. A mysterious intruder lurks. And she is not at peace. I was like constantly terrified. I was really scared. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows and in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see in my room. and the things we fear, there are doors when they are opened. Nightmares become reality.
for months. 15-year-old Kara Dravis has been having otherworldly experiences in her home. It's like that feeling when you know someone's there, when you can just tell. I didn't know if something was gonna grab me. I was like terrified. I kept telling myself, this isn't real. You're imagining it. You're imagining it. In the summer of 2010, Kara's mother, Linda Dravis, lands in New Delhi, India, drops off her bags, and heads over to her favorite marketplace. I am an international in-flight manager for a major airline, major US carrier. Oh, this is so beautiful. How much? 100 rupees. I was going there three times a month, and I was out in the markets, looking at all this jewelry. And I started bringing back a little bit for my friends. Miss Linda, Miss Linda! Ravi, is that you? Hello, Miss Linda, I missed you. I was hoping I'd see you this trip. Ravi's a street kid, and there's a whole bunch of them. They were my little friends on the street. Can you help me with my bags? I would love to, Miss Linda. I think he just liked to walk with me and talk. So beautiful. Come on, Robbie. Let's go someplace else. How many times have I told you no begging? Huh? He's not begging. He's with me. I'm like, no, 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 no. I've known him for two years. He's never stolen anything from me or begged. Madam, you go do your shopping and you leave them to me, OK? okay. Come here with me. You never listen to me, ever, do you? Bobby! Do you have a problem listening? <laughs> Come back in. Now you want to run away from me? Get off of him! Get off! Please, get off. Off. Please get off. Off. No, don't no. hurt me! I need no. No. Get off him! Get off him! Run off him! Run! Run! Get back here! I told you, he was helping me. He's garbage and should not be in this market. What's wrong with you? These kids are lower cased. I don't think they want other nationalities, Americans, tourists socializing with them or being friends with them. It was very upsetting to see a human being treated like that. A few days later, Linda is back at her home in Stewart, Florida, a stark contrast to India. Hey, sweetie, how's school? It's okay. 
Got an A on my science test. That's awesome. I knew your studying would pay off. I was a single mom. I never had any issues with Kara. She knew I was doing my best uh, being a mother and father, and she tried to make it easy for me. How was your trip? This is pretty. I got that one for you. We had a pretty good relationship. My dad left when I was little, so we've always been pretty close. I talked to her about everything. Here, let me put it on. My trip was interesting. You know Ravi, the boy that helps me in the market? He got in trouble because of me. Because of you? He's an untouchable. In his culture, he's not allowed to talk to people like me. You live very fortunate lives. Never forget that. I know, Mom, because you tell me every time. I love you. One night, while Linda is expected home late from a flight, Kara and her friend find themselves alone. Look at him. We were talking, just laughing. I remember we were talking about a specific boy. And she look at him with his friends. <laughs> just not a care in the world. He looks like a dork. He is. <laughs> He's so dorky. Oh, I almost forgot. My mom got this for you on her last trip. It's so pretty. Thank you. Do you think uh, Jason might notice it? I hope so. What was that? Uh, what are you talking about? I thought I heard something. Mom? Alexa, it's not funny. And she look at him with his friends. <laughs> One night while home alone, Kara and her friend experience the scare of their lives. All of a sudden, I heard this loud laugh that sounded like a woman. 
but I couldn't tell you where it was coming from. That was the worst part. Kara, are you all right? What, what happened? What was that noise? I don't know. I think there's someone in the house. Where are the knives? Top, top door. I thought someone's there to harm us. What was that sound? I think someone's coming. We were terrified. Her mom came in, in the door and she was upset. What is going on, girls? I have been knocking for like five minutes. Oh, there, we, there was this thought, voice and just laughing and we thought somebody was in the house. What in the world? It is very late. You need to stop watching those scary movies. Lexa, are you ready to go? Uh, I'm coming to you. Did you check with your mom? Oh, just at least text her. I didn't want to be home alone. I was like, I'm getting out of here. I knew there was someone in my house. Lexa, where's your bag? It's in Kara's room. I'm, I'm not going to get it. Girls, this is ridiculous. There is no one in this house. Lexa, go get your backpack now. <sighs> if you're coming with us, let's go. Kara's mother is surprised to find she's not home. I was upset. I said, Kara, I just talked to you an hour ago. You're supposed to be home. You can stay at Lexa's now because you've already made her mom come out once, but I want you home at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. The next morning, Linda confronts her daughter. Mom, I don't understand. It's not fair. I'm not going to have you scaring yourself like that anymore. I accused her of watching scary movies, which made them freak out. I said, Kara, grab up all those scary movies. We're throwing these in the trash. After playing the event over and over in her mind, Kara makes a realization. Mom, you don't understand. There was something in the house. It was laughing at us. We weren't even watching scary movies. I told my mom that I realized that it wasn't a lady. There was no lady in my house. No one had taken anything. It was, it was a ghost. There was something there, a spirit. You're being ridiculous. There's nothing in this house. No more movies. And you know what? No riding lessons for a month either. Mom. I'm like, Kara, I need to be able to rely on you. You need to grow up. You need to be responsible. How can I do this if you are not on my team? It was just really hard because she didn't believe me. It was just a feeling that I was going to see something or hear something else. And I was like constantly terrified. I was really scared.
15-year-old Kara Dravis is being tormented by a mysterious being in her home. It was just a feeling that I was going to see something or hear something else. And I was, like, constantly terrified. I was really scared. saw it opening and I'm like, oh God, oh no, oh no, oh no. I was terrified. opened and closed by itself. What do you mean? I mean, something pushed it. She was scared to death, and I was trying to remain calm. Are you sure? Why don't you believe me? There was something in the house the night that Lexa was here, and it's still here. I knew something was there. Like, I was, I was positive. All right, all, all right, I don't know what's going on, but I'll figure it out, okay? I'll figure it out. I said there was a logical explanation. I will find out what it is. I don't want you to worry about it. Leave it up to me. Determined to get to the bottom of what's going on, Linda contacts a home safety expert. I did everything I could to find a logical explanation, including a spy surveillance company. We're going to figure it out. So I've been through every inch of this house and can't find anything that could have made that noise. The spy surveillance company basically told me it was highly unlikely that somebody could have broken in and then gotten out with nobody knowing. I was trying to act like everything was normal but I didn't know what to think. Kara? All of a sudden, I was nervous really nervous. I just felt like there was something really watching me. But Linda, an international flight attendant, has been working long hours. I'm working my butt off. I don't have time for this nonsense. You know, I figured I'm imagining it. I was all alone in my house, and I felt something.
Kara? For weeks, Kara Dravis has been sensing a presence in her home. Strange noises. A woman's laugh. A door opening on its own. Now, it's her mother's turn. Kara? <laughs> that sounded unworldly. I don't know where it was coming from. It was just everywhere. It was scary. <laughs> Kara? Mom? What's wrong? I heard it. I heard the sound you've been talking about. I saw a figure like a woman, and I heard that laugh. It's like a high-pitched evil sound. Mom, that's exactly what I've been telling you about. I'm so sorry I didn't believe you. I didn't believe my daughter. I don't think I wanted to admit it because I was the one that was uh, gonna fix the whole thing. I was wrong. It was like such a rush of relief. Like, she believed me. I knew she had heard the noise. What are we going to do? I don't know, but I'm going to figure something out. We're going to be OK. But after that, it wasn't just me scared. It was her, too. Now on a mission, Linda decides to lead her own investigation. I didn't know what to tell her. We were both scared to death. I needed to get to the bottom of this. Hey, Cecile. Oh, hey, Linda. How are you? I'm OK. Is, is there something wrong? I have a kind of strange question. Sure. This is going to sound weird, but you know if anything strange has ever happened in my house? Strange? Yeah, like, has anyone died or anything like that? Not that I know of. It was only built a few years ago. Right. Yeah, OK. Is, is everything OK? Yeah, everything's fine. It's totally fine. See you later. OK, sure. I went to all my neighbors and asked them if they had heard anything. And nobody knew anything. Still, I felt better because my mom was trying to figure out what it was. Desperate for any kind of explanation, Linda does research on the history of the house and the neighborhood. But she comes up empty. With nothing to report back to her daughter, Linda feels defeated. We were both a nervous wreck. The whole thing was very upsetting because I was under pressure to explain it, and I couldn't.
Kara begins spending as much time outside the house as possible, often escaping to the pool. I just didn't feel comfortable anywhere in my house. It was like, I was like being followed wherever I went. I was definitely nervous, and I felt watched. For weeks, Kara Dravis has been seeking to escape from an unworldly presence. Didn't want to be in the house. I would sit in the garage or I would go to the pool. Kara, what's wrong? I thought I saw someone. Come on, it's time for bed. I don't want to go in there. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to find a solution. I don't want to live here anymore. Kara. All of a sudden, my headboard started shaking, aggressively shaking. Kara was upset. She just was freaked out. <laughs> my, my head just started shaking like crazy, and then I, I felt something grab my arm. I thought I was not going to survive in the house. I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> Come on. You're sleeping with me. <laughs> I decided she wouldn't sleep in her own room, and she won't be in our house alone. Over the next few weeks, Linda is at a loss for what to do. I basically felt like I'm going to sell the house. We have to get out of here. We cannot live like this. A friend puts her in contact with a well-known clairvoyant. At this point, Linda is willing to try anything. 
my friend said, you need to call Jean Marie. She's pretty amazing. So I put all my hope into this one woman just to come here and tell me what's going on. Thank you for coming. We've been so scared. It's OK. I'm here to help. When I walked into her house, Linda, she was so frightened and she didn't know what to do. Jean Marie's soft spoken, but immediately you like her. She's just full of love. She's calm, she's serene. As a clairvoyant, Jean Marie has the ability to see spirits and receive their messages. Spirits don't say words necessarily. Most of it's a different way of communicating. And what would come was a feeling. It must be Kara. Hi. Is it okay if I take a look around? Sure. As she walks through the house, Jean Marie finds herself drawn to Kara's room. As I was standing there, it was so strong, and I felt a woman there. She needed to communicate. The spirit that was there, or the woman, she was from India. She was very, very dark skinned and just so huddled up. Since she was a young child, she lived on the streets and she'd never gone inside of a building. She didn't go inside of places because she wasn't allowed to. Hey! Get out of here, you dirty beggar! Go! Get out! Please, sir. I have nowhere else to go. Sandy, get out of here! There's no room for garbage like you! Get out! Put your hands on me! You filthy beggar! You were born a beggar! And now you will die begging! Beg! For more haunting, visit TLC.com. Clairvoyant Jean Marie is receiving a horrific vision from the spirit haunting the Dravis home. It's like you! Get out! Please, sir. Put your hands on me! I felt the fear. Then all of a sudden, I, I could physically, uh, I could swallow. I was like I was drowning. You filthy beggar! You were born a beggar! And now you will die begging! Are you okay? I saw her. Who? The woman haunting your home. Her name's Gia. She was murdered. Murdered? I want to get in touch with her again to find out why she's here. No big.
tanking. Get off of him! Get off! Robbie, run! Help me. When I came and immediately was able to see her and communicate with her, Gia was like, oh, you can help me to tell her. That was huge. I saw her again. She was in a marketplace. She was watching you, Linda. Oh, this is so beautiful. It's Linda, it's Linda! Ravi! You were with a boy. He was in some kind of trouble. She keeps saying the word Delhi. Delhi. Like New Delhi. That's one of my usual stops. How did she get here? How many times have I told you no begging? Huh? He's not begging, he's with me. She saw you stand up for the boy. Ravi. She saw me with Ravi in India. Now you want to run away from me? Stop it! She said that you saved him. Ravi, run! Run! And she said that when she saw you do that, she wanted to come to you. Jean Marie said she liked my maternal energy. So she followed me. It, it shed a lot of light on it. But what does she want? If she's a good ghost, why does she keep frightening us? She even grabbed my arm. Oh, Gia doesn't mean to scare you. She's never had anyone stand up for her in her life. Most spirits can't control how they interact with the human world. She scared them and she felt terrible about it. It was never to hurt people. There was nothing in her that could hurt people. What she wants most is to be a part of your family, to be loved. She wants to stay and live here with both of you, to protect you. It made me feel more comfortable that I knew she wasn't there to hurt me. Jean Marie said, you're, you're gonna be safe. Like, Guy is not gonna let anything happen to you. She's gonna be there. I was kind of like, oh, I have like a bodyguard. This is kind of cool. I felt compassion for her. How could I say, be gone, be gone? That's what she had her whole life. I was very anxious to have her there, but I was not anxious to the point of throwing her out. Kara and Linda follow Jean Marie's instructions on how to make Gia feel at home. Here, sweetie, will you light that side? Huh. Jean Marie said, make her a little spot because all she wants you to do is welcome her in. So we sit on the floor, and I'm thinking, oh, God, this is weird. But to me, it made sense. So, you think this is really going to work? I do. These are all things from her culture to make her feel as welcome as possible. It looks great, Mom. I think so, too. to see her, I could see she had changed. She had positive emotions. She loved them. They, they had actually accepted her. Eventually, Linda and Kara find peace with Gia, but the experience has changed them forever. I just think that it's, it's like refreshing to know that this isn't it. There's more. After you die, I don't believe that's the end. To somebody who doesn't believe, this is what I would tell them. I'm not sure I believed either. What I would say is I think they're wrong, just like I was wrong. And that's what I've learned. There's a lot more going on than meets the eye. This world, there is real evil. In the darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places, 
These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. For Romeo Olguin, this is the beginning of a trial of sanity. A dark entity attacks her in her own home. With the help of paranormal investigators, she discovers a gateway inside her house and another one inside her mind. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Tucson, Arizona became part of the United States. Spanish missionaries came looking for souls to convert. Today, their influences are still felt here. Proof that the past is never completely dead and buried. Holguin and her husband Fernando are at a crossroads in their lives. Romy is between jobs and Fernando has recently retired from the military. They have four children and are staying at Romy's mother's house while they search for a new home. One day they decide to explore a new neighborhood. Romy senses that she is being pulled towards something. I noticed this house that had like overgrown weeds that was very run down. I said, I want to look at that house. Fernando, what do you think? He said, no, you're crazy. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Honey, we'll fix that. I don't see why anybody else would want a house the way it was when we first, you know, saw it. Honey, look beyond what you see now. But I want this house. so special about this house? For whatever reason, I was just drawn to it. The couple talks to neighbors, hoping to find out who owns the house. They learn that it is abandoned. No one ever stays there very long. That night, Romy begins making calls to locate the owner. For some reason, she is obsessed with the prospect of buying the abandoned house. Most people, they don't go look for the most rundown house that they can find and say, I'm going to fix this up because that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. I had young children and I wanted to move out of my mother's house as soon as possible. haunted Romy since childhood. I was really scared that I kept having it and that I didn't understand why I kept having it. I thought it was kind of trying to give me a message and if I didn't understand that I was going to keep having it. Romy eventually tracks down the owner of the house and makes a deal. Honey, we can get the house. I've gone over my bills. You 
really want this? Yes. My brother's ready to start the construction. Her brother, who was a carpenter. So he said, yeah, it's a doable thing. So that's what made us, you know, decide to go ahead and get it. Okay. After months of renovations, the Holguin family moves into their new home. Romy and Fernando's children are glad to finally have their own space. Hey guys, check your box. Make sure everything's inside. Everything's here. Did it's you heavy. open the box? Everything's in there? Yeah, everything's in here. After nightfall, several members of the family are awakened by faint noises. Veronica and Angelica think they hear their brothers talking at the other end of the hall. behind me and she's standing behind me and I'm thinking, oh no. What's in the bathroom? We just ran back to our room and just thought there's something weird about this place. Two nights later. I could sense that someone was there. sleeping. They were sound asleep. I didn't want to tell anyone. Wrong? Because I didn't want them to think I was crazy. I'm just so tired today. Take some coffee. Okay. So I kind of kept it to myself. I don't really like it. I always kept thinking maybe there is an explanation for it. Is that good? A few nights later.
Naomi begins to doubt her own sanity. She assumes that the things she sees are all in her mind. One day, Romy and her sister bring food to an elderly shut-in. There's a black spirit in your house. The moment that he shook my hand, he said, there's a spirit that lives in your house. Please sit down. Please. I don't even know him. I never had seen him or anything. The man says that he is a clairvoyant. He tells Romy not to be scared and suggests that she follow the dark spirit to find out what it wants. Have you followed him? I said, no. I don't care what he wants. I don't want to go there. Be careful. There's a gateway at your house. All the bad spirits might come through it. So please be careful. Romy hopes that if she ignores the spirit, it won't come back. Supernatural attacks Romy Holguin in her own bedroom. Fernando, wake up! Fernando, wake up! I was just so scared. I felt as if those dead people were trying to contact me. I had an uncle that would always say, you should never fear the dead. It's the live ones that'll, you know, hurt you. But I, I beg to differ. Fernando tries to be supportive, but he is unsure what to believe. It was kind of hard because there was really nothing I could do other than just listen to her and try to comfort her. I said, that's it. We've got to stay in the living room, so we stayed in there for a long time. Where it was a ritual for the kids. I just felt better if we were all together. I just felt that I could protect them. One night we were settling in in the living room, and my son says to me, Mom, yeah. I know why you want us to sleep in the living room. What are you talking about, baby? Because of the man in black. When he said that to me, I literally started crying and felt really ill. Come on, baby. If I saw it, it was okay, but I just, I didn't want anything to happen to them. So far, the children don't seem frightened. The man in black, I can't take a chance. You're scared. But Romy cannot ignore the likelihood that her house is haunted. I told my wife that if she was that scared, that we should just, you know, sell the house and move. This is our home. I know, but after this, no. But she told me that she would never sell the house. Fernando, we are not moving out of this house. We have to move out of this house. Romy believes that she alone is the target of whatever haunts the place. We are not leaving. You're scared yourself. The family cannot afford to move. So she decides to silently endure her restless nights as long as her children remain safe. Romy is very, very strong, strong minded, strong will. And she never showed like she was really scared, but I think that was so that the children wouldn't be scared themselves. 
I knew there was something here, but I really didn't think there was anything that could harm us. Soon after, Romy feels something tugging on her as she sleeps. She woke up and, you know, told me that she had a really bad dream. Maybe this last night. I, I said, I mustn't have been feeling so well last night. No, something's not right. I just felt like, like I kept moving. He said, you did. You ended up almost in the middle of the bed, and you were very, very restless. Okay. I was on my way to work, so, you know, I left it at that. teeth marks along the back side of my arm. It scared me so horribly. All I could think of was getting out of there as fast as I could. Romy drives to work unable to comprehend what's happened to her. Joyce, Joyce. For her own sanity, she needs someone to verify that the bite marks are real. Oh my God! You're the person who believes me. Of course I believe you. Look at that. Wow. You see that? Later that night, Romy shows the marks to her husband. Fernando, look at this. That bite mark was really big. Something attacked me in the middle of the night. You could still see him, and that was maybe about eight, nine hours later. Yeah. That was when he first realized that this is something that's really serious, that it really is real. We got, we got to leave this house. Once again, the family sleeps in the living room. They continue to do this for the next six months. Early one morning. I got that feeling that this man in black was warning me that something was wrong. Something was wrong. And I have to go. Romy senses that her elderly aunt, who has been hospitalized for several weeks, is in trouble. I have to go. She immediately leaves to check on her. really early this morning. And when she told me that, it sent chills up and down my back. Within an hour, she actually died. The death of her aunt horrifies Romy. She fears this is a sign from the dark spirit that haunts her house. But is it a warning? or a threat. So what can you tell me exactly about the previous one? One afternoon, when a neighbor comes to visit, Romy learns the details of the house's sordid past. Well, what, what happened? But this house does not have a good history. His father's gone. A younger teen, maybe age 15, had actually shot himself. The father came home and found him shot and then hung himself. Here? I think it was a couple of years. 
for the first time, Romy has a possible explanation for the things she's seen. I had a lot of trouble at school. Kids pick on me. I was afraid that history might repeat itself. That's what scared me. Romy experiences nothing unusual for several months. I could feel like a swirl of ice cold air just going around me, around me. I could almost hear the wind. Romy. 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 having a really bad dream, but I didn't tell her about what had happened because I didn't want to scare her any more than she was already. Finally, Romy and Fernando decide to ask for help. They asked Kenneth Moreland, the deacon from their local congregation, to bless the house. We have a lovely home here. In the blessing of the home, we're actually asking God to be present in that home and to make that home a sacred space. What we'll do is say some prayers together. The couple explains that the house has a troubling history. They fear that something evil is haunting them. The Catholic Church's position on things like this is that we know that evil exists in the world. We don't, as humans, uh, totally understand the realm of that spiritual life, whatever it is that's out there. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right after the deacon left, I felt at peace, and I felt like, finally, this is it. It was just starting to get dark. I started to feel like something was horribly wrong. I don't know if whatever the deacon did just made them stronger at that moment. Who, who knows? It was so frightening. one story where Jesus was approaching his cemetery and a man came out of the cemetery and he supposedly had a legion of devils in him, meaning many, many devils. And they begged Jesus to leave and to leave them alone. And I feel that's exactly what was happening in Romy's situation. We had taken goodness into Romy's home and asked for the presence of God to be there 
and whatever that presence was that was there didn't like that. Fernando returns home from work late that night and finds that Romy has returned to sleeping in the living room. herself becomes a grandmother. Her frightening encounters have become less frequent. She and Fernando remain in the house. Alec, here's your lunch, baby. She takes care of her grandson, Alec, while his mother, Veronica, is at work. Michael don't want me to eat this. Alec begins speaking to an imaginary friend in Romy's house. Alec, who's Michael? He calls his friend Michael and claims that Michael sometimes tells him what to do. I kept thinking that maybe he was just making it up. Michael wanted me to go upstairs. As the months went on, he interacted with it so much that I had to come to the conclusion that he was actually interacting with an entity. Veronica, I'm concerned about you. What about? Romy concerned. tells her daughter that she believes something might be exerting an unnatural influence on Alec. Mom, don't worry about it. All kids have imaginary friends. Veronica, I really didn't think about him being harmed. I just kind of thought of what in the world are people going to think of our family? First my mom sees things, and then here my son's starting to see him also. takes her son home and learns that he is frightened of his new friend. Mama, he didn't want the door closed. He didn't want to be in any room alone. You know, scared of what normal kids are scared of. If something in his closet, something under his bed, or if there was actually something in there that could harm him. There's no one. Because he's my kid, I'd like to just put him in a little glass box and make sure nothing bad ever happens to him. But it's not something that I can control. Alec again visits his grandparents. We're doing that remodeling, and we were upstairs. I was with my uh, grandson, and we were coming back down the stairs. All of a sudden, it just went tumbling. Okay. And then he just turned back and looked at me and said, Tata, why did you push me? And I said, no, I didn't push you. 
Is he was, are you okay, Alec? He said, well, we were coming down the stairs. You feel okay? And all of a sudden, Alec's shoulder went forward, like he had been literally pushed from his back. Alec escapes with only minor bruises. But it's clear to Romy, the dark spirit is back. Yes, hi, is this Amy Allen? After her grandson is pushed down the stairs by an unseen force, Romy takes action. I couldn't handle myself being attacked, but now my grandkids were involved. Romy contacts a professional paranormal investigator who she heard on a local radio program. Investigator Amy Allen visits Romy's house. Her case uh, was very intriguing. It was kind of a state of emergency uh, because people were getting hurt. The first thing Amy notices are nearby radio and TV towers, which emit high levels of electromagnetic energy. Parapsychologists have suggested that this can cause hallucinations. Amy conducts her investigations with the help of paranormal sensitives. Amy, how are you doing? I'm good. Sensitives experience the spirit world in various okay, ways. I tell you a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, you won't even really Some experience it visually. Down. I want to see what kind of feeling. Okay. Like it's yeah. Others through emotion. The technician brings equipment to measure energy in the house. All right, Teresa, this is the living room. Let's see how you feel about this room, and then maybe head upstairs. I wanted one of three things to happen for them to prove and hope that I was crazy or that they would get rid of whatever was there and thirdly that it wouldn't harm my grandson Amy asks Romy and Fernando not to speak with the sensitives about the case they must approach their investigation without any preconceptions. We're very scientific and we want yeah. only the facts and we have to control this as much as possible. Yeah. Are reading for abnormal the team takes baseline energy readings using an electromagnetic frequency meter. This will provide a point of comparison for detecting energy fluctuations during the investigation. Teresa has the ability to sense the presence of spirits and their emotions. detects an unnatural presence. She couldn't really make any kind of direct contact with him or get a story off of him. Teresa leaves. A second sensitive, Rosalinda, arrives to investigate using a different type of extrasensory perception. Rosalinda's a psychic knower which means that she uh, sees pictures in her mind's eye. Something really, really bad. She'll actually see like movies playing in, in her mind.
What she was seeing was roe meat. Because the environment there is so high with the electromagnetic field, it's actually absorbing living energy and then playing it back. So even though Romy and her husband are still alive, they're already being absorbed into their walls of their home and being played back. Rosalinda senses the presence of a dark entity. She tried to leave the room and saw in her mind it saying, go ahead and try to get rid of me. Go ahead. I dare you. Paranormal investigators are convinced that a dangerous entity has invaded Romy's home. At this point, the investigators plan to spend the night there to gather more information. While the investigators set up in another part of the house, Romy suffers through a particularly restless night. All of a sudden, I started to get really anxious. I felt like the room was full of people. You have to get out of here. There are too many people here with us. In the house? No, in this room. I got up like really desperate. My husband said, what are you doing? I said, I have to leave. I feel like there's a bunch of people in here with me. I just have to get out of here. Honey, honey, honey. Please. The next morning, the sensitives share their experiences with Romy, Fernando, and paranormal investigator Amy Allen. I think Romy has some sort of psychic ability. What we are looking for is a correlation between the different types of sensitives. Yesterday, when I was touring the house, I felt a very dark presence in the bedroom, but it was a very strong presence. I had the same experience, too, except Teresa and Rosalinda both describe so encounters with a dark figure. So very dark images. Romy confesses that she has been seeing the same thing for years. We did this. Um, when Amy hears this, she theorizes that Romy herself is sensitive to the spirit world. She said to me, I don't know how you live here. She explained that there was portals in the house, two of them to be exact, that were like a doorway to the other side. Spirits that you're hearing are coming and entering through those portals. That is something that you will find with people who are sensitive, that they may have some kind of vortex or a doorway for the dead. Basically what happens is they're attracted to the sensitive that resides in that location and this doorway is formed so they can try to make contact with the sensitive that's living there. So I think that the spirits that you're hearing coming and going and the voices are actually now, the spirits. I felt like it was all turned around. Not only did I have problems with my grandbaby dealing with this and myself dealing with this and the house being haunted, and now I had one extra thing to deal with. We just need to really go over our data some more. Your own personal strength can you get rid of all these spirits and ghosts in here, okay? So Rosalinda show shows stage. Romy how to perform a ritual cleansing of the house. Put it in this dish. You're gonna burn it. And just wait. She burns that. sage and, and sprinkles holy water around windows here. and doorways. So Romy could also take on a sense of uh, being proactive in the situation and taking care of what was going on and gaining some control herself. Amy Allen hopes that this will help purify the environment by getting rid of negative energy. But she knows they'll have to do more research to put an end to the haunting. We don't say we have a definite conclusion. We can't do that until we've gone over all of the data. People think that when they have investigators come to the home, this person's gonna solve all of my problems right here, right now, today. And unfortunately, that's not how this works. 
Amy Allen goes home to study her data. She must consider many possibilities before taking action. Is the dark figure the spirit of a deceased human? Or something else? A few weeks after the initial visit, Amy Allen returns to Romy's house to perform her own meditative cleansing. She sets up in Romy's bedroom where the most violent events have taken place. I wanted to see, you know, can I do anything spiritually about this situation? I'm a physical medium, which means that I make contact in a physical sense. When I made contact with this thing, it had no response, no reaction. Amy begins to wonder if the entity is something other than a ghost. I did not feel I had made a connection with an actual deceased individual. It was nothing but energy. experience anything that causes you fear, I want you to repeat the blessings with the holy water and tell the spirit to leave, okay? I'm serious. Even if you have to yell at it and say, I don't want you here anymore, be serious, okay? That should help you out. All right, you'll be fine. and I felt like really like I was gonna be sick. I never felt so horrible. I said, that's it. I went back in there finally and I said, I am not gonna let you intimidate me. I'm not gonna let you scare me in my house anymore. I need you to go. I need you to leave. Romy calls Amy Allen for help. Investigation. A dark entity appears in the home of paranormal investigator Amy Allen. Get out of my house. She recognizes the entity as Romy's tormentor. Hello, Amy, it's Romy. It's back. The man in black. No, Romy, you sent it to me. Amy, what are you saying? What are you talking about? What did she say? You sent that man in black to my house. Amy suddenly realizes something quite extraordinary. The dark entity is not a ghost at all. It's a poltergeist. Something Romy has unknowingly manifested herself.
it was like a huge puzzle and I had all these facts and I'm like, it's Romy. The haunting was coming from Romy herself and she was projecting it out into our physical reality. Amy concludes that Romy possesses psychokinetic or PK abilities. She's created a physical embodiment of her own anxieties. Anger, depression, anxiety, guilt, remorse. What that means is it's, it's not a ghost living in the outside world. Romy, because she's in charge of the family, couldn't allow herself to really experience these emotions. This entity is inside of you. What she ended up doing, without her even consciously being aware of this, was to project her emotions out. This consciousness took on its own dynamic force. It's almost like I'm beating my own self up, technically. I was frightening my children that I wanted to protect. I was protecting them from me, and at the same time, I was scaring them. I was the one that was tormenting them, and myself also. I call it my curse. Today, Romy and her family live in relative calm. But they still occasionally struggle with both the spirits that haunt their home and the poltergeist that torments Romy. I would like to control this in a way where I could do good and not evil. But it seems kind of hard for me to do that if, in fact, I have the ability to torture even my own self. If she doesn't deal with her abilities and get a handle on, on her energy and all of these things, it could come back as it was before, or even worse. It really is a curse to me. One thing I found in common with all PK manifestations is that the person needs to have counseling, some type of therapy where they can vent their emotions in a safe, positive space with someone who's not going to judge them or be upset with them, where they can literally unleash all of these emotions that they've kept repressed. So therapy is consistently a recommendation in these cases.